morning everyone, sabah al khair and welcome. I'm very excited for today's panel because absolutely anyone can relate to it. We're going to be talking about retail going digital, which means for us as consumers having everything behind our screen delivered at our door at the time that we want it. But what does it mean for retailers? If we're talking on a global level, retail uh, has, is, is witnessing uh, a lot of competition, a lot of growth, but the Middle East uh, is yet to grow more because we are still lagging behind with the GCC countries leading the way and we uh, are facing challenges and issues related to delivery, re related to um, financial infrastructure with the predominance of cash and delivery for most of the products and services that we want. Uh, technology had, has indeed constructed the whole industry of, of commerce and uh, now the, the retailers can no longer uh, depend on a strategy that focuses on the products. It's now, it now should focus on the consumers and what they want because they are basically in control and only something that would attract their attention a very unique and customized experience would actually mean that uh, they are willing to uh, open their wallets and buy the product. Uh, moving from the normal supply chain of uh, buying low, selling high, and managing and optimizing everything that is in between, we're now looking at a digital supply chain, which depends on data, collecting data on consumers, on products, on services, on locations, on preferences, and then turning this data into insights. And these insights will basically guide the retailers on how to best uh, to take actions and how to best uh, deliver a better and a unique customer journey that would attract consumers and retain them. We have a stellar panel today, and I'm going to start uh, from my left. Uh, we have uh, Minister Zayed bin Rashid Al Zayani, the Minister of Commerce, uh, Tourism, and uh, Industry in the Kingdom of Bahrain. Then we have Abira Sisi, uh, who's the co founder of the online personal assistant via chat called ELFS, based out of Egypt. Then we have my good friend Karim Munaim, who's the managing director of um, Publicity Sapient a large-scale cons uh, technology consultancy focusing and specializing in digital transformation. And finally, we have Amadou Diallo, who is the CEO of DHL Global Forwarding Middle East and Africa. And myself, uh, I'm Dia Haikal. I'm the editor-in-chief of MIT Technology Review. Uh, we are going to have the last 20 minutes for questions, so please, whatever you think about, just write it down, and then we can discuss it after. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Abir. You have a very exciting story of starting in the U.S. and then moving to Egypt based on some insights you got from the consumers and changing your offering into something that you did not start with. So can you briefly talk to us about your experience? First, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, Dia, for having this amazing panel and moderating all of us together. And uh, for the World Economic Forum for really putting this platform in place for all startups that are really trying to make it through like elves um, and putting us in touch with amazing uh, uh, department heads and government heads and uh, putting things together for us. Um, first, elves started a couple of years ago. Me and my husband, Kareem, started elves. Um, elves is a um, digital platform. It's a digital personal assistant through chat. And uh, we were able to scale that platform up. It actually um, tailors to travel, tailors to personal shopping, tailors to gifts and flowers, and we operate globally. So there's pretty much nothing that we kind of refuse as a service. Um, we were able to scale this model up by uh, um, human-assisted AI that works assisting the, the elves that are chatting. Um, in the past couple of years, we were able to scale up to about quarter million users globally, and uh, we were able to be lucky enough to raise a fund of $3 million in the past couple of years. Um, we are operating out of Cairo, and we recently op opened offices in LA. Um, as mentioned, we, are not, we don't have any retail stores. We're not a store that sells something specific, but we tailor to online services. So travel, uh, personal uh, shopping. So that way, it was easy for us to move from Egypt to open offices in LA and uh, proceed with all the customer requests. And we have like, customers that are global, like from Cambodia, 
all the way to Buenos Aires. You don't need to have a presence in any specific location. Great. Uh, Minister, I'm going to ask you, based on what Habir said, and for companies like Habir, and with the, uh, with the e-commerce industry expected to reach $48 billion by 2022 in the Middle East, uh, you as a minister and a policymaker, what can you do to support startups that are looking to venture into e-commerce? Uh, and what kind of support uh, or incentivizing them? What kind of policies would you create? Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, I'm honored and privileged to join this esteemed panel. Uh, I think in order to develop the e-commerce uh, platform in the region, and we are, we are at a very, very early stage of that, uh, we have to have all stakeholders on board. So you have the retailer on one side, you have to educate the consumer on the other side. We as a government or regulator, we have to make sure that the transactions are uh, clean, are, are uh, genuine. Uh, we have to fight a lot of people who use this platform for fraud or manipulation. Uh, we have to put the right uh, legislative systems to support it. Uh, the logistic partners are very important because they are the ones who make sure the goods flow back and forth. And, and I have to stress the point back and forth because a lot of these goods, one of the simplicities of e-commerce is that when you get something you don't like, you can easily send it back. And it's, it's the convenience that you don't have to go back to the store or hassle with them to, to, to get a refund. Um, the IT solutions are a backbone. So when, when we set out to look at it in Bahrain, we, we took it from a different angle and a different approach. And we looked at it primarily to support our growing uh, segment in Bahrain, the sector of startups and SMEs. Uh, and we looked at the landscape in Bahrain back then. This was about two years ago. And we saw that there were a lot of uh, isolated attempts. Uh, and there were a lot of fragmented solutions. And people were often getting frustrated, mm -hmm. not knowing where to get the full solution, uh, lacking direction. Uh, there was no focus. Equally, the consumer didn't know who to deal with, who to trust. And there was a breakdown in, in the whole cycle. Uh, so under the guidance of His Highness, uh, the Crown Prince, he formed the, the SME Development Board, where he put all stakeholders into that board. And he tasked us, and he, he asked me as a minister to chair that board. Uh, and he tasked us to come up with a national strategy on how to develop SME sector and startups in Bahrain. Uh, a big component of it has to do with e-commerce. Mm -hmm. uh, so at the beginning of 2018, we submitted a, a five-year national plan of what needs to be done, uh, what are the KPIs. After five years, uh, we had three main KPIs, and we had 17 initiatives in the plan, which was approved and it, it uh, got affected into action. Uh, so since then, we, we've, we've come a long way uh, in, in this landscape. Uh, a year and a half ago, we didn't have any accelerators or incubators in Bahrain. Today, we have 24. And amongst them, they have more than 650 startup projects ongoing. Uh, and, and it is not just meant for Bahrainis. The majority are from Bahrain, but we have uh, people from all parts of the world who, who sought Bahrain as a good uh, fertile ground to start their startup projects. Uh, we've gone into specialized fields like fintech, and we've launched the first sandbox in the area uh, in, in Bahrain Fintech Bay. Uh, that's proven to be an, an excellent example. And today what we see is a development of specialized incubators in Bahrain. We have one now specialized in fashion design. Uh, we have one specialized in medical solutions, uh, where people are starting to come from all over the world and, and use that uh, uh, s system or ecosystem to develop their ideas. So we do our part as a government to, to lay the ground, to make the environment easily uh, attractive to those people who want to join it. And on the other hand, to regulate, to make sure that those who want to abuse the system or take advantage of it are kept uh, outside. Great. And is it open for Bahrainis and non-Bahrainis? Absolutely, yes. yes. I mean, this is the strategy of the Kingdom of Bahrain. And if you look at it uh, throughout the past, when we launched uh, uh, in the early 70s, when we thought that the banking sector would be a promising sector for Bahrain, we did that and we established Bahrain as a banking hub for the Middle East. Uh, we followed that up in the 80s with the uh, introduction of Islamic banking and Islamic insurance. And again, Bahrain. Uh, 
uh, took the leadership in that in the beginning part of this century when we deregulated telecoms in Bahrain. Uh, we did that, and, and today we went from a single operator in telecoms to 54 <coughs> operators in Bahrain today with, with international companies having regional headquarters in Bahrain for, in that sector. That's great. Karim, you work on, uh, you, you advise companies on transforming <coughs> digitally, and uh, you work a lot with retailers. Yeah. So can you tell me, is brick and mortar really dead? Is the store concept dead? Or are we looking at an omni-channel experience? What is it? What do you think? Brick and mortar is definitely not dead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, however, it is rapidly changing. Mm -hmm. And you have to think, if you step back a little bit, commerce, is it a tech stack? Is it an experience? Um, or is it a culture? Okay. And I think this is probably the fundamental question that organizations have to answer. And also listen to your consumers. Because today, if I asked everybody in the room who has a smartphone, who has access to the internet, who has a credit card or a digital wallet, I would assume 100, if not close to 100%. Then let's ask the organizations or even governments, how many of you provide the opportunity for me to buy your product or service online? 30, mm -hmm. 40. So there's a massive disparity between what we want or what we're ready for versus what we've been provided as an opportunity. And then that's forcing us to buy in different ways, be that cross-border, internationally, grey markets, and so on and so on. So rethinking the business model of what retail has to be today for the MENA region specifically, and if you, you can focus GCC, why the MENA, actually everybody's got their own disparities and differences. I think at the end of the day, um, specifically in the GCC, we have one thing to our advantage, which is summer. It will force you into the malls, force you into stores, and therefore you're not always going to be thinking, I've got to be digital first or, retail, um, or commerce first. I know people are going to end up inside my store. But how can you connect the experience between being online and offline, where you make it into a seamless experience so I can start online at home and end that journey in the store itself without any break in that experience? I think it's fair to say there isn't any truly end-to-end -end connected experience today. So I think retailers have to genuinely step back and start to understand their consumer, listen to the sentiment and the data and do a true analysis on the data and accept what the future is bringing and then try to look at their retail uh, proposition as an experience rather than just a channel to sell, physically sell items in the store. Mm -hmm. And how do you see the readiness? Are they ready to invest? Because it requires a lot of investment in technology. It is. Do and I see readiness? Today's... Um, Retail is still successful, so the traditional brick and mortar in the region is still very successful. So why would you start to invest significant amounts of money in a problem that doesn't currently exist in true form? But that doesn't mean it's not coming. Again, you have to start thinking or reimagining what is the future going to be. Um, so <coughs> organizations, as I said, start, need to start breaking down and start to listen and start to understand what's happening out there. And, and, and start to adapt their models. It doesn't have to be big, major steps. But rather than saying, let's invest 5% of our potential investment fund into a current 5% return, why not invest 20% of what you would normally invest into your store, into your online or your commerce presence, knowing that it's in five years' time that return is going to happen, not next year. So it's some very difficult conversations you need to have with your shareholders, with your board, and you need to start presenting what is the future, what is going to happen, you cannot control that. Mm -hmm. So you need to be part of it. Adapt. Exactly. Today, I am the most powerful person in your company because I am going to choose to buy or not to buy from you. Mm -hmm. And there are too many competitive options out there. So if you don't give me what I want, how I want it, when I want it, thank you very much. I'm going to take my business elsewhere. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Karim. Amadou, uh, a lot of the uh, growth and efficiency of e-commerce in, in the US and probably in Europe has to do with the efficiency of postal services. How do you assess the postal services in our region? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, thanks for having me here. Um, <clears throat> so I'll be talking, uh, speak on behalf of, uh, of my organization, DHL, which uh, you know, does roughly around over 70 million deliveries per day. So we are pretty much 
somehow you know connected with whatever is happening on e-commerce uh, as you know whenever and that is mostly for the younger generation when they sort of go online and check the influencers and then find something that they want to buy that is coming from the US or wherever. Uh, when they click on it, if they pay digitally or not, then you know we have to organize that they get the goods as fast as possible because they want to own it uh, on the instance they have clicked and, and bought it. <laughs> so, and there is this concept from click to deliver um, that takes place across many markets. I was living two years ago in, in, in Europe uh, where I've seen you know, how fast it was developing. Um, what you can say uh, in, in general is that you know, it is very diverse across the region because postal services are not the same across all the countries. Secondly, you know, we have, in terms of buying habits, um, at least from our experience in terms of what we're delivering, 85% of whatever is being ordered online is cash on delivery. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for a postal service to be able to organize the cash on delivery is not always a given because it's not really part of the habits. And, and thirdly, you have a lot of returns. And the imports and exports, you know, uh, sort of presume that you have customs processes. And, uh, and what we do have right now, we don't have the same de minimis in all the different countries. The minimis is the, the, the smallest amount that sort of is not subject to customs processes and documentation. And that is not standardized. And if it is not standardized, then the lead time for you to deliver the shipments of anybody who has ordered online is not the same, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're buying online, you want to have it on the spot, right? Uh, so I live in, uh, in Dubai, like Karim. Um, where we live, you can actually order your baguette in the morning. Uh, you don't need to go to the boulangerie to get your bread. Uh, you can have your coffee and all this stuff. It's delivered. You, you just click and then you get it delivered. So you have a lot of... It's not just the bookshelf that you don't need or the TV that you don't need. You also don't need the coffee machine and all the rest because you can now live without all of those tools mm -hmm. because you are really pretty much using the online platforms. However, there is a real need for simplification in terms of, you know, how do we connect with customs offices digitally so that, uh, you know, we have no break in, in, in the supply chain, but also how do we organize the returns? Because sometimes when you're bringing back a return, some governments, they want to have some custom fees. And, uh, you know, and when you have ordered, I mean, you know, the minister was talking about it before, when you've ordered already, you have to pay your customs, and when it has returned, then you have to organize it. And that is the logistician who has to organize it, the postal services. So DHL, we don't only have a postal service organization. We also have now an e-commerce e division. Um, I think we are the only logistics company that has an e-commerce division on the board. Uh, it is run by our best CEO, who was a big fan of Bahrain, uh, Mr. Ken Allen. And, uh, and what we are trying to do is really to try to decomplicate trade because we believe it is extremely important for us to enable growth. So, and when I look at MENA, um, I don't just look at MENA as a platform of growth within MENA. So, you know, you have a lot of retailers in uh, Bahrain, in Kuwait, in, uh, in, in Dubai, um, who actually have an opportunity to tap into a market that is growing. So you have 420 million new consumers that are in Africa. They don't really necessarily need to have a Dubai mall to be able to access all the goods that are sold at Dubai Mall. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you know, they not, don't necessarily have to re have the bricks and mortars in Kenya or in Senegal or in all these different places, but there's an opportunity for whoever has a store in Dubai Mall to be able to distribute to all these markets. Mm -hmm. And that's where the investment has potentially a, pay, a payback, you know. Um, so we have experience from, uh, from Dubai that actually people ordering online in Gabon can get the goods in 48 hours in Gabon because we are directly connected mm -hmm. from Bahrain and from Dubai into, into to, to, to Libreville. And that is valid for many different countries. And there are 75 cities that have more than a million people in Africa that are looking for goods. So there's a real opportunity for entrepreneurs that are in the MENA region. However, they have to invest in the digital experience because it's from the search to the order to the delivery of the shipment that there is a process that needs to take place. So that is an opportunity for the large retailers. And the competitors, I think everybody, I mean, everybody knows the biggest competitor is coming from the US. And, you know, and anybody who is buying goods is comparing to 80% of the shipments that are actually posted on Amazon. Mm -hmm. So if you want to compete with those guys, you have to go and tackle new markets. If you don't tackle the new markets, then you run the risk of losing opportunities for a long time. Mm -hmm. Now, what is in it for young entrepreneurs? I met a lot of startups, startups from, from Egypt yesterday um, uh, during the conference. They have very good ideas. The 
the only thing that is very complicated for these young startups is to understand that the customs process is a very complicated one because in terms of compliance, you really have to fix how you organize the customs declaration for anybody who's importing goods. And that is where I think that we as large organization can support uh, uh, you know, incubators and, and, and young entrepreneurs in trying to make them understand you can organize your small shop in Lebanon or wherever and then organize digitally that you have a presence across the globe but we have to jointly organize that your exports are customs mm -hmm. clear and compliant because that is really the biggest fear for most of the governments when, we, when it comes to supporting uh, trade growth across all these markets. But there is a huge demand and then you will not be able to build up all these more so you know, we necessarily have to use the digital technology to be able to satisfy, satisfy all the new customers that are coming, all the new consumers that are coming on board. And for us, you know, our purpose is connecting people and improving lives. And improving lives means you know, trying to meet customer demands, customer needs. <coughs> and that only can happen if you use technologies because there's no space to build all these new supermarkets across all these countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. On this point, uh, and having worked in the US and then in Egypt, what are the challenges? I mean, we mentioned delivery, for example. What are the challenges that? Uh, you face that you think are unique to Egypt, to the region, and to the industry, and why? Um, it's quite interesting, this question. Um, well, when in any industry, any startup, you're going to find different kinds of challenges. But the good thing about things like this is listening to what DHL, what services they can provide to small companies like Elves. Right, so I don't have my own fleet somewhere, but I operate globally, and we partner with esteemed companies such as DHL to help us reach all the customers anywhere. You know, and, and same thing with, uh, you know, it's not just stopping at retail. So how everything goes on digital, we, we didn't stop at delivering services and good from different stores and from offline stores. We actually moved that to travel. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be something that's tangible. I'm not moving just good. So when you provide an online service in this digital world, you're actually moving things online. So with travel right now, people just change. So once they buy things from us, they actually want us to help them fly somewhere else. Mm -hmm. right? So that changes from here to there. And um, it's not really a challenge. It's a matter of finding the right partners that are reputable and are able for you to kind of connect between the good service providers and what the customer wants, whether it's uh, uh, services as DHL or the tourism, tourism boards. Right, so these are the things that, for us as startups, are looking for partnerships and to grow with these established companies. And how about payment? Do you have any challenges regarding payment from your consumers? From the consumers, it's uh, in Egypt. It's you know there, people are still trying to get comfortable with doing online payments. Uh, we have a big part of Egyptians that still use cash on delivery, as as he mentioned. But globally, the customers that operate and use elves, again, when you buy a ticket online, you don't go pay cash. Right? So this is where our target is at this moment, is online, travel, tourism, and uh, across the globe. So to us, we don't have any problems with the payments. So we just tailored Egypt just because we're currently operating out of Egypt, and we got to tailor. You have to kind of f formulate something where you're currently operating. But other than that, online, we have no problems. All our customers are very happy with online payments. And we partner again with Stripe. So we find these reputable companies that make it easy for consumers to use our platform. Great. Minister, I, I, I want to ask you, um, we uh, retailers now, if they want to go online, they need IT infrastructure, they need financial infrastructure. So it's not only a retail company, it's basically a technology company. So what does the deal with Amazon Web Services to open in Bahrain uh, have to do with supporting the whole ecosystem? And how would it affect Bahrain and, on a bigger scale, the GCC and the region altogether? I think, uh, if you allow me, before answering that specific question, I'd like to go a step back. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, we have to segregate the, the, the retailers into two parts. The, the well-established big organizations mm -hmm. and the smaller or startup community. The bigger ones, I think they're at the stage where they can find their way and they can develop their own platforms and therefore they may require a lot of a less, a less attention or, or uh, assistance from us. Uh, our primary focus is to encourage the smaller ones and the startups 
especially in a small country like Bahrain, where the geography is limited to think beyond the geographical borders. Uh, we have an excellent logistics system connecting Bahrain to the world, and we should take advantage of that. Uh, and I would like to use a small example here, going back to the bricks and mortar. If you look at traditionally the Gulf market, we all started with what we call Sug, which is the old markets. And then we shifted to malls. And now we're being threatened or challenged by e-commerce. Let's see what happened to the souks when the shift went to malls. And as a minister of commerce, I often get people coming from the souk who decided to stay in their old shop, which is 100, 150 years old, still with a split window AC unit and very basic operation. And they scream and, and plead and say, we're going out of business. We're running out of customers. Nobody comes to us. The malls have eaten up our market. And my first question to them is, what have you done to adapt with times? And they say, what do you mean? I say, well, you still don't have a computer in your shop. You still don't use credit cards. You still don't. And look how many leaps have happened in technology, and you've missed out on them. No wonder you're being left behind. Mm -hmm. So we got to cater for these to make them either catch up or develop them as a niche. And this is one of the projects we're doing in Bahrain now in the old Manama Souk, which is probably the oldest souk in the region. It's more than 250 years old. And we decided that there's no point. Initially, the thought was, let's do something to compete with the malls. Well, I said, no, you're banging your head against the wall. You should develop yourself as a destination, not as a shop, the whole neighborhood. Let's turn the souk in Bahrain like the bazaar in Istanbul. People go to the bazaar because they want to enjoy the atmosphere. The they experience. want to see the experience, exactly. the colors, the smell, the yep. feel. Not because they want to buy a piece of jewelry or carpet or some fruits. They can do that in an easier, accessible shopping mall, air conditioned, you know, uh, easier to get to. They could go at midnight if they want to. You develop yourself like a destination on its own. Once we drive traffic there, retail will flourish. Mm -hmm. And we've experienced that. We've done a few uh, during F1 weekend in Bahrain. We do a handicraft festival in the old souk. And they've come back, as they said, we've tripled, quadrupled our sales during that period, simply because there is footfall. Mm -hmm. So we have to cater for the souks and to promote them, to make them a destination and preserve the heritage of that area so people go there because they want to experience the old setup. Mm -hmm. The same way I think we'll have to do with malls. Malls will exist. As long as they have food, cinemas, and children playing area, they will exist. Because today, a lot of people who go to the malls not necessarily go there to buy goods. They go there to eat, socialize, probably watch a movie, or get rid of their kids for four hours so they can <laughs> You know, enjoy peaceful time. And on the way, they'll buy something from a store or, or pick something up. Uh, so malls will exist. But I think e-commerce will be taking a bigger and bigger slice. So what we're trying to do is to drive the newcomers, the smaller ones, to think of having e-commerce platforms from day one. Don't try to start today to compete with somebody who started 50 years before you in the commerce and has an established customer base, an established product, and come with something that's completely uh, uncreative or something that's been done years and years before you and try to get a market share. Come with a new service. Come with a digital service from day one. Uh, now, we're, we're very fortunate in Bahrain that in the field of IT, I mean, we're very well advanced, uh, not only on the private sector, on, on the government side. I think uh, uh, the IGA in Bahrain, uh, the government authority, has done a tremendous job in, in putting most of government services on uh, electronic services. Mm -hmm. uh, my friend uh, Mohammed Al-Qaid is here. He, he chairs that department, and he's our savior, really. He, he keeps coming with solutions for us. Uh, we, for example, launched <coughs> Sigillat uh, two years ago, three years ago. Uh, where all our CR registration is online today. Uh, despite three years into the operation, we still have people who come into the ministry every day with a stack of paperwork and say, I want to start a business. <laughs> so you don't need to be here. You could do this at midnight from your house online. with an iPad. Oh, no, no, I, I want to. Maybe that same resistance you have in Egypt to credit cards, they still want to deal with a person and exchange paperwork. 
Of course, we handle them. We don't turn them away. But since launching, launching Sigillat, we've seen a huge upshoot in the number of CRs issued. Two reasons, because we're processing them in much shorter time, and we're giving people the liberty to do it off hours, mm -hmm. so in the weekends, in the evenings, and doing it from home. Uh, that has helped a lot. Uh, AWS, of course, it's a, it's a milestone for Bahrain. Uh, the government was the first, again, with, with the, uh, Mohammed Al Qaid leading the way, is that we're moving all government services to cloud-based. Mm -hmm. uh, that helps companies in lowering the costs, like you mentioned, especially with smaller ones. Uh, and it's not only that, it will create a culture for us in Bahrain, especially for startups, to believe and trust in technology when they have a, an international name like that set up in Bahrain. Uh, the same way we have DHL uh, headquartered in Bahrain <coughs> since the 70s, I think it gave an exposure to Bahrain to go from regular mail to <laughs> courier mail. Again, when you have the vehicle for it, you will facilitate the transition to it. Uh, but uh, I, I use an example you cited. We have, under the tourism department, we take care of all the handicrafts. Uh, and they were struggling to sell anything. People were doing it as a hobby. And we started losing handicrafts because with age, people pass away and they don't teach their kids to do it. And then we ended up having less and less handicrafts made. So we decided, very simple, to make a website for them. We did it as the tourism authority. Mm -hmm. We developed it with the IGA. And we put an online commerce portal on it. Uh, we made it multilingual. And we had the prices there even in dollars and pounds and euros uh, and BD, of course. And all of a sudden, they were surprised. They were getting orders from Kansas and I don't know, for, for pottery and stuff, you know. They never thought they could sell that far without even stepping out of their workshop. Uh, it's not turned them into instant millionaires, but it's opening the door to markets they never even thought about. And that's uh, the potential absolutely, going on there. Absolutely. Great. Amadou, I want to um, see your opinion on how you view startups. Minister differentiated between big retailers and startups. So do you see startups that are taking care of the last mile delivery as a threat to you or as an opportunity to collaborate? Oh, so, you know, I also, we also have a startup uh, in, uh, in our own organization. So we have uh, what we call now entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we've seen DHL, so we have a startup. We just moved our first shipment from our digital platform in, uh, from El Ain to Abu Dhabi last week. Mm -hmm. um, so this is something that we're introducing to the Gulf. Um, so how do we stand with startup? So you know, we have a, a, a younger generation of our region, MENA and Middle East and Africa in general, has more than half of the population is very young. And, uh, and they have grown to be using you know, all the social medias that you can imagine. Therefore, they are not really sort of big friends of firewalls. Firewalls are sort of you know, what big corporations like to have is a large IT department so that nobody can access their systems or get out of their systems. So, and this young generation, they want to be able to do their stuff from their Facebook account or from the Instagram account for which, whichever social media that they're utilizing, from Snapchat or whatever, you know, <laughs> not to list all of them. So they are young entrepreneurs and they tend to change jobs much more often than actually classical organization will have in their own structures. <laughs> So, so and every individual, by, by essence, is becoming an entrepreneur by himself. So, you know, and uh, I'm sure you have seen a lot of influencers that you have never heard of that certainly, suddenly sort of bloom out of Egypt or out of Bahrain. I saw, saw a few of them. And what they do is they come up with solutions that are much more customer friendly and help us improve our, the customer experience than classical organizations do. And we try to collaborate with most of them. So, you know, yesterday or two days ago, we had in Bonn, in Germany, uh, what we call the DHL fuck up nights, excludes the language, but that's how people actually call it in, in San Francisco when they, you know, they're trying to check whatever have we tried, which didn't work. And where we also exchange with startups outside and say, you know, we tried this and we tried that technology and it didn't work with customers. But they also come and talk to us and tell us, you know, what is it that they're trying in peer-to-peer -peer solutions, extra, which is working or not working. And it's 
So it's a platform of collaboration and innovation. So, and we see that, we see in startups innovators that are able to improve our processes. We have what we call small I, so improvements on, on our internal processes, or big innovations, big I, which is like you know, revolutionizing the way we do business. So, for instance, we have a, I don't know if you have ever heard of it, we have a new, we are, we are producing cars now at, 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 at the HN. It's called Street Scooter. Mm -hmm. uh, street scooter are uh, electric cars that we use to do the last mile deliveries in most of the urban places. Uh, and we have started it in Germany, so we're producing 5,000, we have over 5,000 uh, street scooters that we produce. And actually it started from a collaboration with students from the University of Aachen. And that has made us one of the largest electric vehicle producers in Europe. So we see it as an opportunity of growth, as an opportunity of disruption, and a, as an opportunity of opening up new market for, for our own organization. And that's how we try to work with all of them. So right now we're collaboration, collaborating with ITC <coughs> from the WTO that's based in Geneva. Uh, and what we're doing with them, so we have implants that are working in ITC. And jointly we support startups that are coming from any markets, from Cambodia, from Vietnam, from Egypt, from, uh, from Ethiopia and help them and give them the, the supply chain experience that we do have. Um, we have created EcomSuk uh, that passed uh, from Rwanda via Morocco into Geneva, actually. And it's a, an Ecom platform, which we have jointly developed with uh, eBay and, uh, and, and the ITC, where we help small women entrepreneurs that are coming from Rwanda or in Ethiopia to sell their fashion goods in Europe, because we think that they can make much more money if they sell them in Geneva than if they just sell them in Addis, or if they just sell them in Rwanda. So that is really what we're trying to, to put in place, because we believe that if you want to, you know, the po world population is growing. And if you have two billion more consumers, you cannot satisfy them with the old processes. So we need to have much more collaboration with many more people so that we can satisfy Know, the normal human beings that are living in the different cities because ultimately we want to improve lives. So it's not about making money, it's not about, about being a big yellow machine, it is about what is it that we will do to make the world a better place and that is really how we look at it. So we work with a lot of startups and we also collaborate sometimes, we acquire them and then we grow them. That's, That's what great, do. so startups here should come and talk to you. Yes. I'm looking for it. Yes. That's great. Definitely. Karim, I have one last question for you before we open the, uh, the floor for uh, questions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, the retailers going online needs a lot of investment and yep. serious commitment. Uh, how does the measurement of return on investment go in this way? Is it that you have, because how could you measure something that you haven't tried before? You can benchmark, but the West has different... Uh, culture, different economies, different, everything is different. So would you basically advise retailers to go into, to venture into digital transformation and then see what insights tell them about measuring ROI? Or should they have it as a set before they venture into it and see if it worked? Because how could you basically know what you don't know? That's the assumption that digital is coming. It's, it's here, uh, along with commerce. It's not coming, it's here. Uh, and, and all of this is opportunity to change and to grow. So I think the measurement of success can no longer just be based on um, the historic bottom line. If you look at most of the, uh, let's call them digital first organizations or um, modern day uh, enterprises, they measure themselves on growth in terms of top line rapid growth, the 10X concept, rather than what is our return to our, our investors in the first year or two years or three years? These are long-term plays. With more traditional organizations, they need to create the mandate of transformation and put a significant amount of budget and manpower behind that. Otherwise, it's going to fail. Okay? And they will eventually fail. I think there's a, there's a statement, a couple of statements. Organizations are very good at telling you what they do today. They have no idea what they need to do tomorrow to be relevant to the audience any longer. Okay? And it's a very hard truth to swallow. If you're sitting in the boardroom and you're turning around and saying, we grew 20%, we've retained our margins, we've done great news, everything is wonderful. By the way, we have this threat, if we want to call it a threat, of commerce, digital. 
which will mean changing the landscape of the people in our organization, investment in new technologies, different approaches to, uh, to selling and engaging with our consumers. It may see us diminish our margins for the next five years. Who can sell that to any board or <laughs> uh, you know, any advisory board or investment board? It's a very difficult one. So what do we do? Well, there are already cases to prove the point. You, you, this is not something that's coming. Commerce is here, and it's an opportunity. It's not a threat. Transformation is happening. If you don't want to do the transformation, sit back and just watch your business fail. Absolutely. You only have to look 10 years ago at Blockbuster and, and uh, Kodak and companies like this. The most relevant organizations of their time, where are they now? Okay, so it's happening whether we like it or not. Now, the, the, the two, two or three key things. The opportunity lies in the SME market. Okay, across MENA. I, I don't actually look outside of MENA, and I'll tell you why. We have for too long looked to the West and the East to teach us how to do things. The West and the East exist here. If you look at the demographics of our region, everybody lives here already. So you cannot map to one or the other. Okay, and we cannot want to just keep wanting to absorb. We now have to stand up. Rather than letting commerce or transformation land with a bump, it needs to land with a bang. Okay, you need to stand up, be bold, be brave. Whether there is government backing or not, whether there is private, you need to stand on your own two feet to make those statements. The SME market right now only contributes about 10% of, of online uh, commerce transactions in the region, okay, versus about 40 to 50% outside. Mm -hmm. So it still sits in the hands of very large um, mono or dualopolistic kind of organizations. Okay. That's going to be hard to break. Just giving a few investment dollars to a startup and saying, good luck, see you again in five years, is not the way it has to happen. You have to invest expertise, you have to invest time, um, and you have to be willing to accept that your business is changing and you are probably going to lose something in the short term to gain much more in the long term. So I think bravery, we need to be braver, we need to be stronger, we need to start ignoring P&Ls and balance sheets because the balance sheet is also gonna change. Your current assets of billions of dollars of, of real estate is about to become a liability when you start to realize you don't need the 10,000 you know, square foot stores anymore. You don't need to be having people, these are experience centers in order to drive acquisition through any channel that I choose. So um, be, you know, be brave in the pursuit of the next and try to figure out how to get there through um, learning from the startups in the region, from the younger generations. Now we talked about cash and delivery. Cash and delivery is a twofold issue, one, it actually still represents more of the older buyers, the silver dollar buyers, okay? And B, it's because nobody trusts the product that's gonna turn up. Mm. There's mm. too many gray market, fake products in the market that you want to touch it before you're willing to give your cash. Mm. But look at the demographics of the region. 50, 60% are under 35. Credit card, digital payments is the only way forward. We cannot ignore that. And I don't think organizations can afford to sit back any longer and just say, we'll see what happens in a few years. You'll become irrelevant. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's great. Um, we're going to we have uh, 15 minutes for questions and answers from. I think before we, that, I just wanted to add one thing to what Karim was saying. Um, I think it's a very important point for corporations and large corporations to start adapting to change because without that, they will fall behind. And all the startups are after new technology. And everyone at this point, everyone's becoming customer centric. So it's not about the dollar value or the P&Ls and the balance sheets. Everyone now, like, and in elves, we don't look like the, the elves actually working on chat. They don't know what partnerships we have. So they actually only focus on what is beneficial to the customer, whether it's this airline or that. It doesn't matter if we've got agreements with Sabre or Amadeus or what. It doesn't matter to them. They matter that the customer will get the best result at the end. And at that point, it establishes the trusts with the customer, mm -hmm. like you're saying. So yep. that's why. I see this pattern with elves in the beginning where we had a little bit of resistance with the Egyptian market paying in cash or not or what so not. Um, at this point, everyone's like, okay, I trust you. I know what you're doing. I know your recommendation is valid, whether it's a product or a service. And that becomes much smoother on the long run. Our global CEO uses a statement. He says the brand is the experience and the experience is the brand. Mm -hmm. yep. So that is the mantra for whatever we do and whatever you should be doing as a startup as well. Yep. Because you have a phenomenal opportunity to disrupt the market. The bigger traditional retailers are in, the, in a state, state of defend right now. That's true. The differentiator is still to mm -hmm. come, but the disruptors, that's gonna be driven through SMEs, ideas, investment in technologies that still, they're saying, should we invest in rather than we are investing in. 
Yep. So yeah, you've got a great future. Th this is, if, if you allow me, why we are encouraging startups and SMEs to think digital and global from day one. Because you never know how quick this will change, and it's changing at a very quick pace. And maybe by the time you get set up traditionally, you'll be out of date. Exactly. Uh, so from the start, think how to have a digital platform. Think how to sell to the world, not to your community or your country <coughs> only. And it reminds me, I mean, I always use the classic case of uh, ATMs when they were first launched. And I mean, I've, I've seen it personally when you go to an ATM and it's idle and you go to the clerk desk at the bank and you see 15 people in line. <laughs> And you ask why, they say, well, we'll withdraw money, but we won't deposit in an ATM because I'm giving away my cash. So it's pretty much like the experience <laughs> you yeah, have yeah. with cash and delivery. Yeah, but issues. 20 years later or 25 years later, you trust an ATM to deposit yeah. a check or cash or withdraw cash or pay your bills. And so eventually it will come. I and as for kids, it's very cards. easy for them to use credit cards because they're using their parents' <laughs> credit course, cards. <laughs> of course, of course, Elena. So the, trust is not an issue there. The, the one other, sorry, one other thing about the, the question around return on investment, the new currency is data. Mm -hmm. okay, the product is going to become irrelevant. Eventually, right now, I can buy something online where I get points through using a payment channel, um, such as Beam in the UAE. I get points from my, my credit card from my bank. I get a discount from the retailer for being an existing uh, client expert. So all of a sudden, the price of the product is irrelevant because all you want is my data, and that's the future of the currency. Mm -hmm. So again, transformation will lead you down a channel where um, value comes through the amount of data you can gather and use to your advantage through the monetiza monetization and personalization as well. Uh, but I think, it's, but, uh, however, it's important to be aware of what is going on outside. So, you know, if you... You know, we talk about credit cards, but you know, if you go and then uh, look at what happens with Impesa, you know, everybody now is moving from credit cards into mobile money. Uh, you know, it's a lot of transactions yeah. that are taking place yeah. via the smartphone, so you don't necessarily need an account in a bank. Mm. Yeah. Um, secondly, you know, if you sort of check what is happening in Asia um, with platforms such as GD.com they are really converting a lot of markets to their own markets and they're owning those markets because they have most of the data and they have you know, deep data analysis on, on consumer behaviors in many different markets. So we really have to push the young generation here to be you know, aware of what is it that is happening that is disrupting the market from many different uh, geographies because everybody is fighting to own tomorrow. So, uh, mm. uh, and there, you know, it is really good to be uh, self-aware, but also digitally aware of what other technologies are going to disrupt, not only the retail, but also the banks and every other transaction that is Absolutely. taking place, because it is most of it going to be based on technology. Mm. And that's where we invite, you know, young startups to come and collaborate, and then they, we can share information that we get from all these different markets. Yeah, and, and as I mentioned earlier, the example that we were, <coughs> not focused on travel when we started and then we found there's a lot of demand people are actually choosing to use elves to book their flights their honeymoon and their hotels and the transportation and that was extremely organic this is not one of our target areas when we first started and now we see everyone's coming on board and everyone wants you know they want to have elves with them because they go to this country and they don't know anyone but they trust us because they've used us several times to make a birthday cake for their kid or buy their wife flowers so now elves know me so i could take them to you know, my honeymoon. They know where to recommend restaurants for my preference. So it's more customized. Yeah. And, and, and all as you mentioned, um, Adair, that people are moving more towards the trust area. And it's not just retail. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. moving across the yeah. board at this yeah. point. I don't want the audience to miss <laughs> asking you questions. So let's move. Great. We have a question over there. Sure. Uh, good morning. Yazan Abu Hantash, Bloom CPI. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Diallo, um, you talked about uh, the custom barriers uh, across uh, you know, the globe for the e-commerce. Mm -hmm. My question is about uh, how, how can we make it easier for e-commerce exports for fresh food from the Middle East to Europe and US because we face lots of problems with food control. Do you have an experience with that? Well, thank you very much for that question. So, you know, fresh food is something that we are focused on, but, but particularly about the imports, because we import a lot of fresh food from Italy, from uh, France, uh, from the UK, as much as we import mangoes from Kenya into, in, into the Middle East. Um, what you do have is that, first of all, into Europe, you have regulations that are protecting the European market that, that do not allow for people from our region to actually to export into Europe. 
Um, and it is so complicated in terms of how the mango has to look like, how the banana has to look like, that you sort of would turn mad to read all of the regulation that they have invented in Brussels. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of market opportunities within our region. So, you know, uh, for instance, in Egypt, uh, our organization in Egypt uh, is exporting a lot of cheese and uh, fruits from Egypt to French people who are on vacation in Mauritius. Because in France, it's very difficult to get it in France. So, and, and for, because you, know, you have a lot of vacation resources that are across all of our region where people actually from Europe come on vacation. And, and for me, you know, it is always around you know, sitting with the entrepreneur and trying to understand what is it that you want to export and how you can get to those customers that you cannot actually get into because the European Union is putting some barriers that are not really sort of good for, for, for our traders, right? Um, second thing is for me when I'm talking about the minimis, so every country has different uh, regulations. So right now, Australia is trying to put the minimis down to zero because they want to protect their retailers from Amazon and from you know, all these big uh, uh, technology platforms, which is fine in terms of being protective. But you know, pro we are for free trade because we believe that the consumer in Australia should have the opportunity to choose if they want to buy something that is made in Australia or something that is made in Guatemala. But if these trade barriers are sort of increased, then e-commerce becomes compli complicated, then the customer experience becomes a nightmare because then you're pushing people to go through illegal channels, which is not helpful. And then we want to have standardized, value-based, uh, the minimi so that we know that we can automatically put our process. So that is what we have in Bahrain. You know, we have a joint agreement with Bahrain. We interface completely to the customs organization in Bahrain. So, and we don't need to always stop every single shipment and open the box and check it in detail because then it just <coughs> good for perishables, for example. So, and that is what we're also requesting from Europe. But we need the authorities also here to fight together with us to say, you know, the market has to be open. You know. And this is what we did with DHL in Bahrain to extend it even to Saudi yeah. because a lot of the trans shipments <coughs> come to Bahrain and go by truck over the causeway. Yeah. So we <coughs> agreed with the Saudi authorities. We have five major exporters out of Bahrain that use the causeway. DHL is one of them yeah, yeah. to be labeled as trusted shippers. Yeah. And they don't get searched on every truck and every mm. consignment. They get very minimum sampling, and therefore their goods flow much quicker. That's true. So that's what we do for operation. Hi, my name is Azam Alamiddin. I'm with Visa uh, Inc. And uh, we heard a lot about payment, and, and I heard technology, and I heard data. So, so I would like to bring a, a different angle to the conversation because we covered infrastructure, organizational transformation, technology infrastructure, and logistics and supply chain, all very important. But there are two other angles I would like to hear from the panelists, their views on, which we, from our experience, see as equally important to the other uh, axis of growing digitization of commerce. One is awareness and education. So we often see a lot of marketing, but training awareness and education to all, to retailers, governments, and, uh, and, and the public is a very important angle in our experience in the region, in MENA, because people are still, the trust element is still an issue. Uh, being financial literacy and being digitally savvy, I know the younger generation are online all the time, but using payment as a, as a, as a means is still met with some fears and, and hesitation in many countries in MENA. Maybe not in the GCC, not in Dubai, where I'm also based, but in other countries in MENA. The second element, uh, which is very important, is the government role. And in government here, uh, I want to take it into two different directions. One is government leading by example. Mm -hmm. So in many countries in MENA, governments are still collecting their own money through cash. And even if they have acceptance <laughs> means they're still surcharging, there are other issues within the policy mechanism of the governments. So this is, government is the largest merchant across MENA. So this is one very important role that government has to play in, in our experience. The other one is the policy and regulation. And here you're talking about technology that is very fast moving. Every day there is a new innovation in payment. We're talking proximity payments and online. And I will conclude my intervention with this. So the policies and regulations need to be agile and nimble and always changing and adapting rather than fearing 
what's coming. So uh, the minister and the other panelists will be keen to hear their, their views on these. Thank you. Uh, I think I probably didn't give it a lot of justice in my opening remarks, but I did touch on mindset. And you're absolutely right. We have to change the mindset and educate and aware, make consumers and retailers aware of this changing paradigm and how purchasing habits are changing. Uh, it has to do with, with probably curriculums at school. It has to be to do with awareness campaigns. And I think it started already. I mean, I can talk about Bahrain as, as a, a definite case. I'm sure other countries in the MENA region have also uh, adopted some form of it. Uh, it won't change overnight. A lot of this is to do with the trust issue between the consumer and the retailer. And one of the biggest things we face in the Minister of Commerce and our consumer uh, relations uh, or consumer protection department is fraud and, and uh, uh, non-genuine products and both on Instagram or any other uh, social media. And it's difficult. It's difficult because you don't know who you're buying from. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't even know who the seller is. He could be some guy in Malaysia, and you know, how can we track him? How can we uh, stop him? Uh, but as an evolving process, I think the process will solve itself with time. We can expedite that period or shorten it by putting regulation, by putting uh, you know, uh, more floodgates. Uh, but there will always be cases of fraud or, or mistrust, yes. Uh, but the mindset is definitely where we should start, that this is the wave of the future. Uh, I remember earlier when, when, for example, accounting packages were launched. A lot of companies were reluctant to switch their accounting to computers or, or uh, IT-based solutions and say, no, no, I can't. I can't afford it at the end of the year. The system could crash. I won't be able to close my books. I'll lose the list of who owes me money, my banking, all that. Now I think almost everybody does it uh, uh, that way. Uh, government role leading by example, I think, like I said, Bahrain, I mean, we're, 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 we're definitely leading by example, going cloud-based, pushing all, all the uh, government services on IT. Uh, we still do accept cash in very, very small portions in government, but most of the payments today are done electronically. Mm. Uh, recently in Bahrain, we've had a huge uh, launch of all these e-wallets and uh, prepaid services uh, on a consumer basis, and they've been catching up steam and uh, for the better or worse, I don't know. Now we lose track of how much we give our kids money and what our household expenses is, but uh, it's, it's a fact of life. We're getting accustomed to it. Uh, but policy will have to play a vital role to make it a long-term success. And we have to uh, shut out the violators at a very early stage. The quicker we do that, the more... Uh, genuine the process becomes for the ones who really want to make it work. Great. I think we have time for one last very, very quick question. We have here. Two people there. <coughs> very quick question. My, na my name is Hamoud al Mahmoud, Editor-in-Chief, Harvard Business Review, Arabia. To you, Kareem, uh, for digital transformation, uh, physical stores are struggling if they want to create their own Virgin, digital version or not, uh, there are some uh, failed experiences like uh, Walmart in the US. They did it. Uh, both versions uh, conflicted and competed each other. Do you, do you think it will it will work eventually? You have Carrefour online and Carrefour physical, uh, different uh, prices, maybe different costs or yeah. the same. Um, so funny enough, we work with Carrefour and Walmart globally on exactly these these two challenges. Um, and both have accepted they've been so slow to start, mm. they will never catch up. So their whole business modeling has to change from a global point of view. If we regionalize it, grocery market is the smallest commerce market right now behind electronics, beauty, um, uh, leisure and everything like this. So the growth opportunity there is phenomenal. But if you go onto any of the, the, the grocery retailer sites right now, very limited lines, 
okay, probably 10 to 15% of what's available in store, so why would I even bother? The delivery consistency is so poor, so we talked about last mile. They also call it last smile because that is the only time you actually see somebody in the transaction. So your closing stage of experience has to be positive. If I'm waiting four hours for somebody who called me saying they'll be there in 10 minutes, or they call me and say I'm outside your door, I'm three hours early, it, it's, you know, so there is inconvenience rather than convenience uh, to the overall program. And the return policy. I mean, uh, there, there is very variable quality of return policies in a sense. This is a representation of how I will call it a broken commerce kind of um, modeling that exists inside of these organizations. I, I don't know what the dark store uh, experience is, for example. So do they have stores that are set up in the middle of nowhere designed to service um, online purchasing? Or is it just done through current stores where they run around, somebody run around to pick up the order you've done online? So there is a number of steps I think regionally we need to be taking. Again, though, the supermarkets are owned by the same brand that owns multiple other brands. Okay, so there is an, uh, there has to be a belief from the the licensee owner, who has a responsibility to grow that business, and also the international brands such as Carrefour to want to enforce the ways of working, the commerce drive, uh, in order to roll it out properly. I, I think we're years away though from that happening. But I'm, I'm sure you have heard about you know om omnichannel. So if you you can go and check it. Uh, uh, on the online platform, so you know it's not anymore about e-commerce or mobile commerce. It's any channel uh, uh, that the customer wants to approach you with, and then you, as a customer, when you come and then you say you want to buy mangoes, for instance, on 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 a Carrefour platform, Carrefour should be able to tell you know everybody that bought bought mango also bought the banana that is coming from Nigeria it's or whatever, you know, so that you have all these suggestions that you actually wouldn't have by yourself. And, and that generally, you know, this is how this mango has been rated compared to the mm. mango that is coming from Peru. So these are all information that you want to have without having to click mm. and search anymore. Mm. And that's why it's important to have all of it integrated so that you have a much better customer yeah. experience. Unfortunately, sorry, Kareem, we're out of time. So we can continue this discussion um, <laughs> after the session. Uh, thank you very much for a very insightful panel. And it was full of hope. Habir told us how... Uh, uh, there is appetite for uh, consumers to use online and they're getting more and more used to using uh, financial uh, payment online. Uh, the minister told us about uh, Bahrain and how it's more open now uh, to uh, startups, so you know your next destination. Uh, Amadou told us how they see opportunity with collaborating with startups and how they are actually willing to invest with them. And uh, Karim basically uh, talked about how either for uh, the readiness that every, all retailers are ready and those who are not are not going to be in business anymore. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> you Thank you so much, Leo. <laughs>